All right, everybody. Happy Sabbath. I'd ask that everyone keep their mics on mute for now until we until we join the uh, until we have the question section, which is at the end. Um, I will make brief pauses in between the presentation. If you have any questions, just kind of wave your hand so I'll be able to see you guys. Um, I don't know if anyone who's not visibly, they don't have their camera active, just write something down within the chat if you have a question and I'll pause and try to answer it as much, but we try to leave most of the questions towards the end. Um, thank you for everyone who, who decided to join. Today we're going to be talking about, uh, we're going to be talking about the topic is no new thing. So history repeats itself. We're going to look into scripture, how things that happened within the past are within Bible history, within Bible stories, with, um, are actually repeating themselves now. And um, to, under, to understand how to prepare for the future, we have to take a, a look at the past because Paul says that these things are given as in samples for us. So before we begin, we're gonna make we're gonna um, go into a quick prayer. Uh, if we could just bow our heads, close our eyes. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this blessed Sabbath day. As we come together and go over your word, Lord, I ask you that you place your your words inside my mouth as you did Jeremiah, Lord, in the time of uh, before captivity, Lord. Help. Let these words not be mine, but yours, Lord. I ask that um, they bear fruit and everybody has, that has been able to join us in this room, Lord. I ask you to be a light within my heart and to, to help everybody come to some type of truth, Lord. Let the words that I speak convict and let the light that shine not be mine, but yours, Lord. And we ask this in Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right. We're going to share the screen again today's topic again hi to everyone that's here. <laughs> um, um, today's topic again is no new thing underneath the sun. This is a scripture from Ecclesiastics. Um, let me just get my screen up. Uh, can you guys see this. I can't really see upon okay so. We're going to be talking about Bible symbols and keywords that unfold narratives uh, within the scriptures of the Bible. Again, our basic, basic scripture structure is Ecclesiastics um, chapter 1, verses 9. Um, this is going to be uh, the kind of repetitive scripture that we're going to use to go from the past to the present to the future. Again, the, the scripture says this, the thing that have been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing underneath, under the sun. That's a little tongue twister. But <laughs> um, basically what the scripture is saying is what I just said. History repeats itself. Us as human beings, I don't know if this is how God designed it, but we don't learn our lessons. We can see that we can see this throughout history in the Bible. You see that after countless um, of miracles that God performed for the Israelites within the wilderness, they still didn't believe, went into times of captivity, went back into idolatry because our human nature is naturally to rebel against God, all right? The first thing we're gonna start off with is, uh, wait, let me. I'm gonna start off with, can you see this? Can you guys see this? Uh, Genesis 45. No, you can't see it. Okay, so let me just switch that real quick. Still trying to get used to this. Oh, 
<sighs> okay. All right, in Genesis uh, 45, we have, we have David, I'm sorry, we have Joseph. If you're not familiar with the story of Joseph, one of the brothers of the, the, the 12 tribes, he goes into captivity uh, uh, because his brothers sell them into slavery. And as a result, he's in bondage to Egypt. He's in, as a result, he's in bond, bondage to Egypt. The scripture says, and they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man his dream, and one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in, in prison. Why am I bringing this scripture? Um, Bear with me one moment. Why am I bringing this, this scripture to you, you guys' attention? Remember, the basis is there's no, there's no new thing underneath the sun. We have to, to understand the scriptures, we have to look for Christ within every story of the Bible. Believe it or not, Jesus is in every single story within the scriptures. First example, we look at um, we look at the story of Genesis. We look at the story with um, Abraham, and we look at the example of his son Isaac. We know that Isaac was given as a sacrifice, and we know Jesus was given as a sacrifice. By understanding Bible symbols and Bible's antitypes basic scripture can actually open into another world as i said the whole point of this is to get you to see what is about to come within the future everything that's happening now has happened in the past we're we're currently in the middle of a quote-unquote pandemic right or should i say pandemic? let me not say that because you know <laughs> right um the God know that there was going to be a pandemic or a pandemic? Yes, he did. Nothing catches God off of, surprise, off of guard. Like he knows what's coming. The reason why I'm bringing this specific scripture to your attention is because if we know, many of us have read the four gospels. If you haven't, I don't know why, why you're holding on to your Bible. <laughs> within, the, within the four gospels, we have the story of Christ. Obviously, from four different perspectives. We know the ultimate conclusion of every, every story within the four gospels is Christ dying on the cross. That's the ultimate, that was the ultimate sacrifice. That was the ultimate goal. In the story of, in the story of Joseph, he was innocent. Christ was innocent and he was sent amongst prisoners he was the head of a whole prison he was in between two people he was in between in between joseph was in between a butler and a baker jesus was on the cross between a thief one who survived and he ended up getting sent to heaven the other he just didn't accept the truth which was right in front of his face as a result we would just assume he lost his salvation we don't know. We'll find out when we all get to heaven, God willing. The baker here, or would I say the cup, the cup bearer here, is symbolically an antitype of the thief on the cross who had his life spared. The baker who had the vision of the, the crows on his head. And how they were packing is symbolically an anti-type of the other thief who was on a cross who we just assumed lost his salvation. 
as we, again, as we read these stories, we see, we're looking for Christ in the scriptures. If you never read the four gospels, you would just think this was a regular story. But most Christians today, they read the gospels. And when they read the gospels, they have it memorized. I started with the four gospels and went backwards and the scriptures opened up. Let's, let's look for another example. Many of us is, is familiar with this. The story of Samson. All right, the story of Samson, many, many of us are familiar with this. In the book of Judges, um, chapter 16, verse 29 to 30, it says, and Samson took hold of the pillar, of, of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood and on which it was borne up, of the one with the right hand and of the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistine and he bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the Lord and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more, more than they which he slew in his life. Again, we're looking for Christ within the scriptures. Look at the imagery. We're thinking of Christ on the cross. Christ was in the center of two pillars. Both the thief who accepted Christ and the other thief who rejected Christ. That's one symbology, one antitype. Then we have another antitype within the story of Samson, where Samson bowed his head and he gave up. He gave up the goals. Again, verse 30, it says, he bowed himself with all his might and the house fell upon the Lord. He bowed his head. Remember, Jesus Christ bowed his head and gave up the, the Holy Ghost. We have another antitype. And upon all the people that were therein, so the dead which he slew at his death was more than they which he slew in his life. In death, he conquered. In Christ's death, he conquered. Antitypes, we're looking for Christ within the stories, within the scriptures, okay? Next story, we're gonna, we're, this is just a buildup. Now we're gonna to touch upon something that's more relative to today and why it's important that we, we pay attention. In the story of Daniel in chapter one, verses eight, if you're not familiar with this, I encourage you guys to read this. This is a very, very important book within the Bible. It goes hand in hand with the book of Revelation. I want you guys to just pay attention to what's going on here. Daniel is brought into captivity with three other Hebrew boys um, after the days of prophecies within Jeremiah. They were told that they were going to go into captivity for, I believe, 70 years. And it was nothing they could do about it. They were going to go into captivity. That was it. And, it, and a test is brought upon Daniel. This was one of the first tests that's, that's brought upon Daniel and the three other uh, Hebrew boys that's with him. It says, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. I want us to just think about this for a second. There are three layers to scripture. The first layer 
is the actual biblical account or Bible story. The second layer is the story of Christ within the scripture. And the third layer is how it will reflect us in the future to come. Remember, the ultimate goal of everybody is to have Christ manifested within us. Christ says that the servant is not greater to the ma greater than the master. He says, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. Again, let's pay attention to the scripture. What did Daniel do? He purposed in his heart when, when unclean food was presented to him, when the wine of Babylon was presented to him, he knew this wit against what he believed in. And that he could not do this because it would ultimately like um, mess up his relationship with God because it goes against the commandments. Well, if we read the four gospels, a similar test, rem remember this is before Christ is even in the picture. A similar test is brought to Christ's attention when he is brought into the wilderness. I'm pretty sure y'all familiar with this. But we're going to just, we're going to take a look at it. We're going to take a look at it. We know that Christ was brought into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. And as a result, he faced Satan with multiple temptations. One of those temptations was an anti-type or the true type of what Daniel went through in, in the book of Daniel. Matthew chapter four, verse three. And when the tempter came to him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. So Daniel went through a similar temptation in regards to food and Christ who was tempted in all the likeliness of man, went through the similar temptation of food. So what could we expect in the future? Remember, three layers of scripture. We have the legitimate story. We have Christ within the scriptures. And then we have the application to us. So we can expect a temptation in regards to food, in regards to something unclean. Does this ring a bell? Anyone? <laughs> you go ahead, you can um, unmute your mic, uh, Jen. When he was tempted in the wilderness by Satan uh -huh. and um, he was told to uh, to eat, you know, he was saying, you know, turn these bread, this, these two uh, stones into bread, mm -hmm. you know, and he said he cannot, uh, he, he won't be tempted, uh, or he said, man can't live on bread alone, but by every word of God. Every word that proceeds out the mouth of God. So I have a question. Yes. My, yes. my question is, are we in this time now? Is it coming in the future in regards to an event where it doesn't necessarily have to be food, but something that can defile us if we take it? Can you can anyone think of that situation that's going on currently today? Go ahead, Jen. I think it is the um, there's vaccinations. That's one of them. I honestly believe there's many more to come because they are already starting on a second pandemic with this other COVID uh, variant that they're talking about. So that might be another one. Um, they're also going to make it where you won't be able to do anything unless you take that vaccination, you know, uh, or have proof that you had it done, you know, so. Ultimately, we can say that this is a test right now. Yes. This is a test. So by we, I don't know if you guys 
I'm pretty sure you yeah, have seen the videos with Tiller. He went over these, these vaccinations and he spoke specifically about what was inside these vaccinations. A lot of unclean, a lot of unclean items. Oh, bear with me one moment. Got other people joining the room. Uh, anybody who's just joining the room right now, I just ask that you keep your, your mics muted until we have the question section at the, at the end. And uh, I see, uh, I'm, forgive me if I butcher your name, but, but Ray, I'm so sorry. <laughs> you have to have some type of, I'm gonna just call you Ba, is that fine? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If you want, you can unmute unmute your mic and uh, so you can pronounce your name. <laughs> yeah, it's Bahari. Bahari. Yeah. Bahari. Okay. So Bahari, I see that um, you wrote that there's going to be COVID twenty three even. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. But again, this is the this is a current test and a lot of us who are not prepared for this test will most likely not pass the test that's coming afterwards we all know that daniel went through two tests i don't know if, if you don't know we know that there was an image a golden image that daniel had to bow down to um sorry that the three hebrew boys had to bow down to and if their minds were not right originally from the first test, they were most likely to fail the second test. Um, we, these, these things that are placed within these vaccines, we have such things as I, I hear like aborted baby fetuses. Um, I hear uh, pork. We know these things, these things are unclean. So for us to know this, and attempt intentionally take them, which is just going completely against the word of God. It's going completely against the word. Again, this is the first test. We can expect a second test. If um, I'm just explaining things and assuming that a lot of you guys have watched the movie Babylon to America, um, watched the second one so you know the second event that's coming up is quote unquote called the Sunday law. Okay, again, if you don't, if you fail to pass the first test, because we know that the battle is for the mind. The battle ultimately is for the mind. Christ is trying to get in here. He's also trying to get in here. The heart is linked to the mind. And so is Satan. Satan is trying to do the same thing. It's, it's competitive. Christ says, I'm at the door. I'm knocking, I'm trying to get in, let me in, you know? If we, if we take these things and we're susceptible to these things, we're opening our, ourselves up to deception within the future. So um, let's carry on. We're gonna uh, go through the next, I guess you could say symbolic type. Where is it? Okay. So we, um, here's another uh, anti-type or quote unquote true type or whatever, whatever you want to call it, right? In the book of Esther, you have a situation Remember, we just got off of the topic of bowing down to the image. The three Hebrew boys, they chose not to. And as a result, they were thrown into the fiery furnace. This happened. This was a repetitive structure of violence against God's people within the scriptures. It's also in the story of Esther. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath, and he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, 
but they had shown him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the, the whole kingdom of Azuaris, even the people of Mordecai. Situation we have here, we have Haman walking around. I, I, I want to be like the most high. The whole Bible is about the great controversy. Who is the fight between? The fight is between Satan and, the, and it's between Christ. They're going head to head towards each other. Wherever you find Christ in the scriptures, you're also going to see his counterpart, Satan. In this story, Haman is an anti-type of Satan, and, and Mordecai is an anti-type of both the Israel, Israel as a nation and both Christ. Again, we read, it says, and when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath because the people of God will not bow to the, down to the image of the beast in the future. Revelation 13, an order is going to go out to kill them. Again, this happened in the past. We see this here. Haman didn't want to bow down. I mean, Mordecai didn't want to bow down. Decree goes out, destroy all the Jews. Nothing new underneath the sun. What happened in the past is going to repeat itself. Again, when the image is set up, which is church and state combining together to make a Sunday law that makes God's true Sabbath day void, then all hell is going to break loose and persecution is going to hit the church sevenfold. Again, Mordecai, a type of Christ. Mordecai, a type of the church as a, as a nation. Now, how can we compare this to the story of, of Christ? What was the second temptation? Would, was that the second temptation? I don't know exactly if it was the second or third. I have to check that. But what was the temptation that, that Satan brought to, um, to Christ in regards to worship? Anybody? Anyone? He dared to jump off the cliff, yeah? He, he, told, he told Christ, if he worshipped him, he would give him what? Oh, the cities of something on Jerusalem, something like that. <laughs> Told him he would give him basically all of the kingdom in, re in regards to, because Satan was claiming the earth has his, not knowing that Christ was there to refute his dominion on earth. Satan automatically had in his mind that the whole world belong to him because Adam had lost dominion with Eve when they ate the fruit. So this was Satan, like the world is mine. I conquered. But no, Christ, Christ is saying, nah, -uh. <laughs> the world is not yours. But Satan offered Christ, if you bow down, if you worship me, I would give you all of the all of this king, all of this kingdom. Again, a form of temptation in the form of bowing down and worshiping. All right, next sequence. Now I have a I have a question. I'm going to have a question for you guys. Let's see if you guys, somebody can figure this out. You guys see this? Okay. The Bible speaks about 
these are antitypes. The Bible speaks about three Elijahs. I'm pretty sure people are familiar with the first Elijah, which is here on the left. He was taken into heaven, a devout prophet of God. He was fearless, uh, made fire come down from heaven, asked God to, you know, to destroy like 50,000 men. And he was just bold until the end. Then he was kind of like, he got scared of Jezebel and started running off <laughs> until the end. But that just shows you that like, like us, we're not, we're not perfect. We have weaknesses, you know? These are devout prophets of God. And even, even then, he still questioned his protection in regards to, um, in regards to the situation between him and Jezebel when she came to slay, to slay him. He ran into the wilderness and he just wanted to die. We have a second Elijah. Let's go to Matthew. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 17, verse 12. And we're going to read this real quick. As that if uh, anyone wanted to volunteer to read, I like to have everybody kind of interact with this. Any volunteers to read? Uh, <laughs> um, okay, go ahead, Jen. Just remember to unmute your mic. Okay, which one are we reading? I'm sorry. We're reading Matthew chapter 17, verse 12. Okay. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the son of man suffer them. Okay. Um, in, your, in your best description, what can you say that this scripture is, is talking about? Remember this, three Elias, Elias, which is also short for um, another translation of Elias is Elijah. We know that. Elijah. Yes, mm -hmm. so we, we see that there was Elijah in the days of Jezebel and Ahab. Mm -hmm. Now we're having a reference to an Elijah. This is Jesus speaking, of course. So your best description as to what you believe the, the scripture is speaking about. I believe that it is, um, it's, he's referencing himself in that, um, when he first came on the scene that they, they don't see that he, what he's saying is I am in the father, the father's in me, or they didn't recognize him, even though he is, you know, in plain sight, uh, Elias or e Elijah, my son is Elijah also. <laughs> um, they, um, they didn't, they didn't recognize, they didn't, they didn't acknowledge um, I guess his power, even as John the Baptist, you know, John the Baptist came to also foretell, um, for, you know, foretell a uh, son of God. And um, they didn't, they didn't believe him either. They didn't recognize, re recognize him when he came, even though John did, you know, and um, so same thing with the first, with the first Elijah, you know, he ran and everything. I know that he ran, <laughs> but uh, that's human nature, you know, get a little scared there. But, you know, he, he, he came and when he, he was, uh, when he was prophesying about Jesus coming, um, they didn't believe him. They didn't, you know, the people didn't believe him either. So I think that this particular, um, scripture is is saying that they already he already he's here and and he he was already he was already um prophesying to you and nobody believed him just like jesus is right there <laughs> telling them to son of man i'm here and they don't believe me they didn't recognize him excellent excellent um Bahara? Yeah. 
Um, I was going to ask you. I I a hundred percent agree with what um, Jen Johnson said. My question to you is: So we know Elijah both came literally, and then in in the spirit, then John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. Uh, can you tell me what was the ultimate job of John the Baptist? Like, what was his, what did his position require in regards to Christ? Great question. Uh, he was the way maker, you know, he came here to prepare the way and prepare people to, for the Messiah to come in. Amen. He came Amen. Here to prepare people in spirit and in, you know, purity and everything to receive Messiah, the Messiah. So both perfect answers. Again, history is repeating itself. Um, they were making straight, John the Baptist was making, basically preparing the people to get ready for Christ um, to come, which he ultimately did. There is a scripture within the book of Malachi that I wanted to go over with you guys. And in Malachi, let me just pull it out first. In Malachi, it, it, it gives a reference. Malachi is the last book before the New Testament. It gives a reference, if you guys can see that, I hope you guys can see that. In, in Malachi 4, 5, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, my, now my next question here is, when Jesus came, was that a dreadful day? It wasn't. So what time could this scripture possibly be referring to if Elijah physically came? Oh, pick me, pick me. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> this refers to the judgment day when the day of the Lord is coming. Mm -hmm. Jesus came to bring the year of the Lord's grace or the Jubilee, right? Mm -hmm. So exactly like you said, originally we had the, the, the real Elijah come in the time of Ahab and Jezebel. We had John the Baptist come with the spirit of Elijah. And then we have a prophecy that's pertaining to an end, an end day spirit of Elijah coming who are going to get a people ready for the end time day or dreadful day of the Lord. We know that when Christ came, he came in the form in the likeliness of, of of carnal flesh we know when christ returns he's going to come in his glory in his glorified body and it ain't going to be pretty for if you got sitting there right it's not going to be pretty so now i want to show you the power of symbols and antitypes within the scriptures in regards to how the word can open up another layer. Because many of us, when we read the scriptures, we read it at surface value. The scriptures have so much layers to them. If you're not familiar um, with Bible symbols, again, um, Taylor from School for Prophets, he's done multiple videos. Um, if you watch Babylon to America, he tells you how water is people, how a beast is a kingdom, how according to, um, what is that, 6-2, uh, Jeremiah 6-2, that a woman 
the, a woman represents the church. And we know, according to scripture, that there are two churches. We have the church of God, which is, again, in a reference as a bride. And then we have the harlot, which is Satan's woman, which she, she just likes to sleep around with everybody. Just, just put it around with, with different multiple churches, all right, fallen churches. So we're gonna go again, we're gonna open up scripture. Bear with me a moment. And we're going to take a look at a specific scripture. This is gonna be the last of the day. I didn't want the study to be too long, just straight into the point. Next week and, and the week after that, we are going to be looking over difficult scriptures that seem contra, um, they look like they have some type of contradiction or maybe scriptures that's pertaining to, to false doctrines that a lot of the world believe. And we're going to tackle them um, with other scriptures that combine together because we know that the Bible says you, you, you can't just take a verse for what it says. You have to read it in its context. You have to read it um, by the chapter, line upon line, precept of, uh, uh, upon precept, here a little, there a little. Okay, let's, uh, we're going to go and look at this specific scripture. Remember, I, ju I just went over with you guys. I just said that according to Jeremiah 6, 2, um, I believe it says I've likened my, I've likened Zion on, onto a delicate woman. So Zion, which is also representing the church. I'm, I know I'm not saying the scripture verbatim, but I know it's Jeremiah 6 too. We know that the church or the bride is represented as a woman and Satan also has a woman, but she is known. The bride is dedicated to Christ. The harlot is not, is basically all over the place and has multiple multiple doctrines and false doctrines and most of the world is in bed with her today revelation 7 5 it says and upon her forehead was a name written mystery babylon the great the mother of harlots and the abominations of earth okay my question, now my question is, for, for this woman to be a mother, to be labeled a mother, it means she must have daughters. Now, if the woman, Babylon the Great, the mother of Harlots, if she's a mother, that means this is a mother church. This is a mother church. So she must have daughters and these daughters must be daughter churches. Again, if you've seen, again, again, I'm speaking as if I'm assuming that you guys have watched Babylon to America and you know already who the mother of harlots is, how it's in reference to um, false doctrines also, okay? Um, if you are not too familiar with Bible symbols, go into Google, type in Bible symbols, put amazing discoveries, and it will go through a list of Bible symbology and the, the, the scripture reference to these, um, to these symbols. Again, a mother church that has daughters. We know the mother church to be the, the Vatican with the false doctrines that's amongst the whole entire world, the Roman Catholic church, the papacy, but the papacy has daughter churches. These daughter churches, the word Babylon means confusion. They have confused doctrines doctrines that are not biblical okay and they these doctrines are abomination 
These doctrines are abomination. Now, when we look at a specific story, remember, every time we read a story within the scriptures, we are looking, we are either looking for Christ, and from looking for Christ, we'll it'll open up an avenue to see other symbols. Now we're going from looking to Christ to looking for symbols that either represent these churches, looking for symbols that will represent us as a whole. Let's take a look at a specific story within the Bible. This took place in the time of Christ. In Matthew chapter 14, verse 8, it goes on to say, and she being instructed of her mother, emphasis on mother, said, give me here John Baptist head in a charger. John, Pat, John the Baptist came in the spirit of who? Elijah. What did John the Baptist come here to do? Make way and prepare a people for the Lord. Remember this. We have a mother here who instructed her daughter here to give John the Baptist head in a charger. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for the old state and them which sat with him at meat, he commanded it to be given to her. And he sent and beheaded John in the prison and his head was brought in a charger and given to the damsel and she brought it to her mother. Antitype and type. I want you guys to picture this. The mother church instructed the daughter churches to bring John the Baptist who came in the spirit of Elijah wanted his head in a charger. The papacy ordered the, or the daughter churches, Protestant churches, the churches that have these false doctrines, so we have the papacy ordered the Protestant churches to bring John the Baptist, who represents us as a people who are going to make the world ready for Christ's coming. So the papacy is ordering the daughter churches to basically have our heads in a charger. Can we see this in scripture? Let's go to Revelation 13. In Revelation 13, Again, assuming that you know who the first beast and the second beast is. If you don't know who the first beast is, I'm going to sum it up real quick. And I, I stood upon the sea, Revelation 13, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, ten horns. We know this as being the papacy. The reference is in Daniel. This same power, um, it, uh, this same uh, religious and political power got its power from the dragon. This is, this is the mother church, 
This is the mother's church or the harlot that's in relation with the dragon would represent Satan. This church gives power to the second beast. And I beheld another beast come out of the earth. We know that as being the United States, when the United States came out of not conquering other countries, but just came out of its own independence, became a nation, and it had two, two horns like a lamb, and it spake as a dragon. We know the lamb represents Christ. Uh, when we look at scripture, behold the lamb who takes away the sins of the world, which represents Christ, and it spake as a dragon. So we have the United States that takes the form of Christ, but speaks as Satan. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him. The first beast before him is the papacy. And calls if the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he do of great wonders and make it fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of, uh, of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast. Remember, we saw the, the, the types and the anti-types in, in prior stories. We've seen that in Daniel. We've seen... Um, uh, we see that in the story of Christ, they wanted these people to bow down to an image. And those who did not bow down to this image, he had power, verse 15, he had power to give life onto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak, and he caused that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he calls it both small, great, rich, poor, free, bond to receive the mark in their right hand or their forehead. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast, the number of the name. But the key thing we want to concentrate on was those who didn't worship the beast were killed. Okay? We have two things. We have a religious power. And we have, you can say, a political power. So you have church and state combining to persecute those who don't worship the beast. We know in the future that a group of people are going to come before the dreadful day of the Lord, according to Malachi, that are going to come with the spirit of Elijah. And when they come with the spirit of Elijah, according to Rep. Revelation 13, they are going to be persecuted. They are going to be killed for not, for not worshiping. Revelation 24 says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands and they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. What happened to these people? What was the consequences of them not bowing down? What's that? Yes, exactly. Sounds, what happened to John the Baptist who came in the spirit of Elijah? Exactly. Exactly. So I'm not over here saying that we all going to get our heads cut off. That is not what I'm saying. Um, I like my head on my body. What I'm saying that there are going to be people who don't want to deny Christ that God will give them a special grace where they would ultimately lose their life to get into the kingdom or before denying God or disrespecting God. 
we see this throughout history a lot. There was a lot of martyrs. We, you look at Christian history, there was a lot of martyrs. But the Bible also speaks of a special group of people who they done perfected Christ's character to the point where they're translated. We know them as the 144,000. They're translated to not see death. Um, they go straight to heaven. So we have a class. We look at we look at history. We look at the times of of Nero, and we notice that uh, during the time of Nero in Rome, he he fed a lot of the Christians to lions. Uh, it was sports. It was games, and as a result, the the blood of these martyrs multiplies the seed. And I always, this is just me just summing up my personal thoughts. A lot of people will get scared because they're like, you know, you never experienced this before. It's, it would be your first time going through it. I think anybody would be scared before the, the, the event actually takes place. But we're promised that God will give us a, a special grace that we'll be able to bear that time if he counts us worthy to go through it. From my personal opinion, for God's will to be called upon you as to be a martyr for him, this is my personal opinion. I feel this is, this is the ultimate like respect from God. Because if we are to ultimately be like Christ, Christ died for us. You know, I'm not saying that there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with us just going straight to heaven. But God knows what each and every one of us can handle in this room. He knows exactly what we're capable of going through when, when, when fire hits the, when, when, when the tribulation comes, when the trials come, he knows what we can handle. So, you know, my advice is like, just don't be worried. If God calls you to this time, it's because he trusts that you can, you can make it through that storm. Again, the ultimate sacrifice would be your life. And your life would be, a, it, it, it can have, um, it, it can have, you losing your life can have benefits because it might be the means of others getting into the kingdom. A lot of people don't look at it a lot of people don't look at it that way, but a lot of, when you look at history, when people became martyrs, the Christian faith, faith exploded. Uh, Nero thought he could just kill the Christians and it'll be all good. I'm saying Nero, but technically and spiritually speaking, it's Satan. Satan thought that by killing the Christians, he could just destroy everybody and he would ultimately have control over the earth. This is his ultimate goal in the end. This is what he wants to do. He wants to extinguish everybody because he cannot get to Christ. He persecutes the church. He went to make war with the remnant of his seed. Now, again, going back to what, I, uh, what we were talking about. Mother church, daughter church, they combine together. Notice something that we didn't we didn't really pay attention to. We have the mother church, and then we have the daughter church, which um, represents evangelical um, Protestantism. You have the mother church, which represents the papacy, but something's missing. Who did? Who did um, the mother, who did the mother, I forget what, what her daughter name is. Her, who did Herodi, or I can't, I'm not pronouncing it right. I don't want to butcher it. <laughs> but um, who did the mother, Salim, there you go, Salome, thank you. So they went and asked someone who was in power for the head of John the Baptist. So this is symbolically an antitype of 
the church coming to Herod, which represents the state, to combine together to persecute the church. Church and state. Herod with the daughter churches combined together to persecute the church. And as a result, we have martyrs. We have people who are dying for the faith. Lastly, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here. This is going to be the last um, anti-type. And then we're going to start. We're going to go into questions. Um, let's go into... Let's see if I can find this one second. All right. Where are you, Esoid? All right, we're going to go into the story. This is going to be the last anti-type. We're going to go into the story of, we're going to talk about Satan. Not the way I wanted to end it, but end on Jesus. That's what the questions are for. Um, bear with me a moment. Okay. The, 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 the story of Satan and the rebellion within heaven. Do you guys know that the Bible actually has an end. We know that there's anti, wherever there's an, a type or an anti-type of Christ, there's an anti-type of Satan because the whole Bible is about the great controversy between Christ and Satan. If you pay close attention to many of the stories, remember wherever Christ is, you're gonna, you're gonna see his counterpart. We went over the story of Haman and Mordecai. Haman was a type of Satan, and Christ was uh, Mordecai was a type of Christ. To get a view of what happened in the rebellion in heaven, because the story of of his rebellion doesn't go. Sorry, his, the story the story of his rebellion doesn't go too much into detail. It says in Revelation um, 12, 7, and there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and the dragon, which is also Satan and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon, bear with me. I'm so sorry. Bear with me one moment. One moment. And the great and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels was cast out with him. We know um anyone who is going just please do the mic. Brassard. Yeah, thank you. Um and I heard a loud um a loud voice saying in heaven now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. We know that Satan was cast down from heaven and a third of the angels was taken with him. Wherever Wherever a true story is, there is a counterpart, a counterpart story. Let's take a look at this. We're going to check out numbers, and we are going to go to chapter 16. Notice the heading 
of the chapter, Korah's rebellion. Let's just substitute this and call it Satan's rebellion. What, what happened specifically during this time? And, they, and now Korah, the son of Izar, I'm going to skip that, uh, verse 2. And they rose up before Moses with certain of the children, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. Men of renown. Let's, let's picture the rebellion in heaven. Satan convinces a third of the angels to come against God's congregation. He convinced high ranking angels. And here we have Korah who convinced princes of the assembly, men of renown, types and anti-types, okay? And they gathered themselves together against Moses, and against Aaron and said unto them, ye take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore, then lift ye up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. Satan's argument was, I can be holy without the Lord. I don't need to follow the commandments. I can do this on my own. I can do this on my own. And as a result, Korah initially was looking to take the place of Aaron. What was Aaron's position? Aaron was a high priest. What do we call Christ? a high priest, what was Satan looking to be like? God. He was looking, I shall be like the most high. He was looking to take, Korah was looking to take a high priestess position. Although he was not certified, he was not author, he didn't have the authority to be in that position. And as a result, the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men uh, appertained to Korah and all their goods. What happened in heaven? Satan was cast out of heaven into the earth. He was cast out of heaven into the earth. And all the people who was associated with him. Are you seeing the picture? The third of the angels. Cast down with Korah, which is an anti-type of Satan. So although what I'm, what I'm trying to get to you guys, for you guys to understand is wherever Christ is, Satan is. Wherever Satan is, Christ is. Wherever that controversy is, we're in the middle of it. So you have Satan on the left, we have Christ on the right, and we're in the middle of it. All right. So now we're just gonna we're gonna open up for questions. I leave it. I, I say about thirty minutes of questions. I have the 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 um the e sword open. We'll answer the questions only with Bible scripture, nothing else. I'm, I, I want to give my opinion. I might throw it in there a little bit, but all the answers are going to be scripture. So if you, um, how can we do this? Let's see how we got to do this. If anybody has questions, just write it down in the, in the chat and we'll go in the order that the, that the chat is.
Liman, if, if you just audibly ask, so if it's more interactive. I guess, you know what? Yeah, you're I'm right. Just, to be honest, I'm like tired of this Zoom thing and everybody be on mute all the time. I feel like mute all the time. The, the, you know thing, what I mean? the thing is, it's, it's just, ah, oh, it's suffocating. Oh, it's if, it's multiple, if it's multiple people, it could get a little bit, but I, I mean, everybody can, I guess everybody can unmute. I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody has respect for each other. So one person asks a question and we'll go on from there. I, I think there's enough people in here to where, uh, you know, it won't get chaotic. So again, go ahead. If you have a question, just, just ask away. I just have one, I wanted to ask, what do you mean by anti-type? You see, you say type and anti-type. Yeah. I've never heard that. So if so, you can clarify that, please. So there, there's types meaning where you'll see a story in reference to the Bible. I mean, in, in reference to Christ. And then, I mean, you'll see the story of Christ and then you'll see another story that has almost the same parallelism. And then anti-type would be similar, but the, how you say, the parallelism is, is kind of reversed. So for example- Contrasting it. There you go. Okay. So I'm trying to think of the perfect example for this. Um, let's see, an anti-type. Uh, let's... Your whole lesson, sir, was on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But... I'm, I'm trying to think of one that we didn't go over. Um, okay, so by this would be an anti-type adam sin and the whole world um was basically in a sinful state because of his sin and then you have christ who came in because of his death the whole world is saved so that would be an anti-type a type would be a similarity in in, in story reference anybody else i had a question about the two witnesses yeah. Um, it is referenced there in, um, in Revelation about the two witnesses. And I know that it does talk about how it's uh, basically two bodies. A lot of people think that it is Moses and Elijah. Um, I believe that it does say there that it is uh, the two olive trees and the two lampstands, which I think are two bodies of, 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 um, two bodies of Christ, like of the church, right? There may be the Jews and then the Gentiles that are grafted in. That's what I'm thinking. Um, and I, you, why I'm bringing that up is because you had referenced it to, um, to the beheading of, you don't have people being beheaded. Um, and these two witnesses, they do um, have some sort of special powers, you know, type thing. It, it talks about that. And then ultimately they, they die and that they are, you know, in the town square or something, everybody can see them. Mm -hmm. Do you think that right now, what is happening in current events, do you think that we're already at that point? Or do you think that, um, do you think that they, the two bodies have not, I mean, the two, you know, witnesses have not shown yet? Okay, so here's, <laughs> I'm gonna try to be as quick as I can. Yeah. Many people believe, and I used to personally believe this myself. Many people believe based on that, that scripture that the two witnesses are legitimate people. And I've seen countless videos on YouTube about this. And um, I, again, I personally used to, believe this, but our authority should always be scripture. Always has to be scripture. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? Let's go. We're going to go check this out right now. We're going to go to, I believe it's Zechariah chapter four. You know what? I'll make it easy. Let's just actually get my Bible. 
We're going to go to Zechariah chapter 4. First of all, let's, uh, the two witnesses, where was that again? That's Revelation. If someone can write the, the, the scripture where the witnesses are, we can read that first. And then we'll go, we'll go to Zechariah. It's um, Revelation 11. Revelation 11. I see you, fellow Israelite. I see you, man. Hold on. <laughs> All right. Yeah, he's, got, he's on top of it. <laughs> yeah. I, I, All right. So in Revelation chapter 11, it says, and there was a sign uh, given me a reed like onto a rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise. And the measure and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it was given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread under the foot for 40, uh, 40 and two months. And I will give power unto my witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and twenty three uh, twenty three days clothes in sackcloth. I want to stop there. Remember how I was saying that we have to read everything in context, line upon line, precept upon precept. If you notice, according to verse two, it says that, but the court is with, without the temple, leap out and measure it, for it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread under foot for 40 and two months. This is a prophecy. We're seeing a number, 42 months. This is why it's important that we read the book of Daniel and we read the book of Revelation together. The 42 months that's spoken here, let's see if I have it here, is the same prophecy that's spoken in Daniel, which is the 1260 day prophecy. And the scriptures you want to write down, if you guys, if you guys want to, this, this, the scriptures pertaining to this prophecy that are all linked together, we have Revelation chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. You got Revelation chapter 12, verses 6 and 14. Revelation chapter 13, verses 5. You have Daniel chapter 7, verses 25, and Daniel chapter 12, verses 7. 1260 days, 42 months, which is written here in verses 2, and three and a half years are all pertaining to the same time prophecy. Three and a half years is equivalent to 42 months. For uh, 1260 years, there's a prophecy. I mean, there's a scripture that's in Ezekiel 4, 4 chapter 6, that says a day is equivalent to a year. <laughs> that, a, that a day is equivalent to a year. So we have to use this, um, this timeline to to kind of add it up and you'll see that all this is pertaining to the sign, the same prophecy time period. Now let's, let's continue. And this, this time prophecy is in regards to history. Uh, if you've seen uh, Babylon to America, or you've seen uh, Tiller's videos, you will know that uh, the Bible cannot be separated from history and history can't be separated from the Bible. This 42 months is speaking about the dark ages of the papal supremacy. And this started from, excuse me, this started from um, AD 538 to, and it ended at 18, I would say uh, 1798. That's when, that was the deadly wound of the papacy by General Berthier again. Tilla has gone over this multiple times in his videos and he's doing re review videos. It's a long study to really go over. So um, what I will do is 
after I upload this, I'm going to actually send you guys a chart that you can look up or you can actually check it out, you guys yourself. Just go to BibleProphecyTruth.com. If you, if, um, fellow Israelite, if you can, if you could write that in the chat just for everybody, it's BibleProphecyTruth.com. And you go on, on there and they'll give you a chart and you can, and all, and the chart actually has the dates and the scriptures that's associated with that time period. So the math makes sense. I remember when I first uh, came upon this, it was so difficult for me to understand, but the more I kept, I really wanted to understand, the more everything started to make sense. This, this prophecy period is talking about when the papacy had control over the Bible. The two witnesses, like a uh, fellow Israelite had just typed here, in Zechariah chapter four, verses three to six, it says, and the two olive trees, which are in reference to the two olive trees that are in verse four. The verse four in Revelation 11 says, these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before God, um, the God of the earth. When we go to Zechariah chapter four, verses three to six, it says, it, it explains you what the two olive trees are. And two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and, and the other upon the left side. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me saying, what are these, my Lord? So now Zechariah is asking, yo, what are these two olive trees? And they give you the answer. Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me saying, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Like it felt, just like fellow Israelites said, the two witnesses are not legitimate people. You have to remember what book we're reading in the Bible. This is a book of Revelation. It's the most symbolic book in the Bible. Everything is not, if we took everything literal, then... Um, there's some dragon that's about to bite some woman in Revelation. Uh, <laughs> you know, we can't take it literal. Uh, the, the book of Revelation is very symbolic. So what are, what are the two olive trees? The two olive trees is the word of God. It's both the Old Testament and it's both the New Testament. Those are the two olive trees. And during this period of the 42 months prophecy, the papacy, who was in control from 538 AD to 1798, they cast down the Bible. They killed it. They killed the scriptures. Okay? They killed the scriptures. If you were caught with a Bible, you were killed. You were not allowed to, to have scriptures at all. They suppressed the word. But guess what? Throughout all history, from the early churches, God always has a remnant people. And during this time, we saw um, groups of people like the Albergensians, the Waldensians. These were people who had the Bible stored in their mind. So the truth was God always had a small remnant of people. And this is described in the book of Revelation when we look through the seven churches. The seven churches are a history of God's remnant church all the way up to the very last church, which is the seventh church, which is Laodicea, which is currently now, there's a remnant church that has God's truth, all of God's truth, okay? And this church is saving God's truth. And when the time comes, they're gonna come out with the spirit of Elijah and warn the world about this coming situation, which is called the, the Sunday law. All right. So definitely check out. I recommend you guys again, BibleProphecyTruth.com. Understand Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy is, is not going to, if you believe in Christ, it's going to make you believe in him even more once these things start to make sense to you. Any more questions? 
anyone? I have one more question. What's our study going to be about next week? <laughs> um, next week we're going to be look. We're going to be tackling um, difficult scriptures. Uh, we're going to be looking at scriptures that, at, at first glance, they look like they say something, but but it it isn't what it is because people are not reading it in its full context. We're going to look at reasons why people believe in um again similar things to what Taylor was going on in his videos but we're going to go we're going to try to get in as much depth as we can into specific scriptures we're going to look at scriptures that speak about um any day being the um the lord's day you could worship god on any day is that what really the script is talking about we're going to be looking at scriptures that says oh are we allowed to eat anything as long as we we uh pray it up to God, you know, no, that's not true, but we're going to be, we're going to look at the context of the whole entire chapter. We're going to look at reference scriptures so that when people come to you with these, oh, well, this scripture says this, you'll have a way of, remember, because God tells us you study to show yourself approved. So we'll have a way to present ourselves um, to them when we're put on the spot, because guess what? They're, come, they're going to come a time within the future where we're going to go before councils and God is going to bring things to remembrance that was always there. So that means it has to be there, you know? So we have to, we have to be prepared to give an answer for what we believe in. All sorts of false doctrines are going to come in, in, um, in the future. We have to be prepared for this time we look at things like uh scriptures about the state of the dead i was actually going over this with uh with one of my cousins earlier this morning um you know earlier in the evening and we were talking about the state of the dead and why this is important because two doctrines are going to deceive the whole world it's sunday sacredness and it's the state of the dead it's the immortality of the soul many people think when you die you either go into hell or you're going to heaven is why is this so important why you need to know this because the devil preys on our sensitivity if you have a loved one who passed away guess what satan's going to call on a demon tell the demon hey appear at that loved one tell them that you you just came back from heaven and you're going to be so caught up in a moment that you'll forget the word okay so we're going to be looking over uh scriptures I like that, what Leon said. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are which testify of you. Amen. Um, it's the link. Okay, uh, fellow Israelite posted in the chat the link to where you can actually see, actually see the prophecies and see the scriptures that's associated with, with them. Uh, fellow Israelite, let me see what else he's saying. The four horsemen are also the church. I agree with that, fellow Israelite. Um, the seven churches of the book of Revelation and the four horsemen are both the same time period. The four horsemen is just a broader time period of the seven churches. The seven churches in the book of Revelation um, from chapter one to, I believe it's three, are more specific in detail in regards to um the the four the four horsemen yeah so um that's where i was thinking about how it said the two witnesses are the two bodies of church uh, of, of two churches mm -hmm. like the candlesticks um i was watching something from um aoc network or so, uh, I knew something it. i knew it well i i well, i'm quite <laughs> Yeah, because you know what I'm reading is it's I don't know if it's lining up or if it's not lining up. I'm I'm not sure, you know. So um, I wanted to get more specification on it. And I, um, I'll, I'll I'll give you I respect I respect the brother. I respect yeah. him a lot, but be very very careful because yeah. I used to I used to follow him, and there's a lot of other people who's who's in here right now who would tell you that because remember 
we have the we have the church of babylon and then we have the daughter churches a lot of people who are raised up within the evangelical churches and they're actually going to the schools these these schools to be ordained ministers yeah they've been these these schools have been infiltrated by babylon the papacy yeah. is yeah. in all these schools so what they're doing is they're indoctrinating these people in false doctrine. There's, yeah. there's more to what we should be doing is praying for these brothers that they come to the truth because yeah. they're deceived. They're deceived. Yeah, I, I actually thought about going to college myself. And then when I started to look at this one particular university for theology, uh, I it was like, they, their ethics statement kind of was off. So I was like, oh, and I grew up, um, my, my family's Protestant Methodist. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I see that there is a lot of, you know, um, culture and tradition over scripture. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I was like, this is not what I grew up learning when I started really getting into the Bible. I started to really read it. And, you know, and I saw AOC Network on YouTube, but that watching him led me to Tilla's, um, you know, and then when I started watching the, um, I watched the Babylon America, America to Babylon, I watched that. And I was like, that sounds more realistic to me cool. than what they're, you know, and when I saw the two witness movie that the AOC did, I did more research and I go, Okay, well, let me see. There's a little confusion there because the way that he put it seemed legit, to be quite honest with you. However, because Moses and Elijah are no longer in existence, I doubt they're going to be, you know, coming, you know, here. So, you know, it makes more sense that they would be two bodies of, of people that follow, you know, the t God's word, you know what I mean? But um, I, so I just I need actually, a clarification. I actually, but, um, not to stay too long on this, but yeah. I actually watched that video. Yeah. And you have to pay, pay very close attention. Yeah. He's a very good um, person when it comes to editing videos. Yeah. But it was one thing that he slipped up on. And I noticed it and I went through the comments to see if anybody else noticed it and one other person noticed it. Yeah. There's when it comes to when it comes to prophecy, there's there's a pattern that you have to stick to. And he used the day to year principle. Yeah. And then he flipped it for one part of the if oh, prophecy, you understand so exactly if, what you're talking about too. Yes. So so I, if he's saying a day, a day yeah. equals a year. And then he gets to another portion where he just says it means a literal day. A literal if, day. If you're not, if you're not mentally inclined to the scriptures, you'll just go over it. And and this is the deception is you're just looking at the video. Yeah. And you're not paying attention to you're not paying attention to what the word is. And this is why yeah. it's important for us to just stick to the scriptures and yeah. not be amazed by what we're seeing with our physical eyes because. To the, in today's day and age, what we see is what we is what we behold and is what we believe. And again, this is one of the ultimate deceptions. In the end, a lot of people don't know Satan is actually going to appear here on earth before Christ comes. And what does Christ tell us? He said, "Blessed are those who believe and have and have not seen." You know, you're more blessed if you believe in just reading the scriptures than having to see with your physical eyes. But a lot of people don't believe because they don't see. So when Satan appears as Christ, a lot of people are going to believe it. Because why? Because they choose not to read the scriptures and just believe everything they see with their eyes. All right, so we're going to take... We're supposed to live in the spiritual world, Brother Brad. We're supposed to live in the spiritual, like we're yeah. already there <laughs> in the new kingdom already. That's how we're supposed to be living. It was, um, uh, I actually have my cousin. How you doing, Sarah? <laughs> um, we had a talk earlier and I, and it was a good conversation of uh, brother Darius from SFP, uh, school, from school for profits. 
he has a channel. He's probably live right now also. We had a conversation where he was like, you know why, um, you know why he said he doesn't understand. It's crazy how people believe that God made the heaven, the earth and the seas. But when it comes to everything else, they have problems to believe it. And I was talking with my cousin and she said something that was just so profound. She said, it's because we can physically see it. We can physically see it. And I, was, I, I thought about it for a second. I was like, it sounds so simple, but it's so profound because it's true. We go through trials and tribulations. We believe that God made the heavens, the earth, and the seas. But when it comes to, oh, he'll never leave us or he'll never forsake us, we can't believe, we have problems believing that. I find, I find that uh, so odd. <laughs> I, I find that very odd. But here's my proof. Okay. Here's my proof that God exists. Mm -hmm. This is all his word. So mm -hmm. when someone says, oh, yeah, how do you know this? You know, and I go, well, hi, we have a physical documentation proof here. It's, you know, live your life by the book, by this book. So, I mean, that's, and, and you'll see it. It's, it's real. It's so real, you know? Amen. All right. Let me see if there's any more questions. If not, we'll, we'll close in prayer. And um, fellow Israelite, you, can, you, you brought up a good, a good um, topic for study, Colossians 2.14. Uh, I run into that all the time with people. So maybe... Um, Maybe that might be a good topic for, 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 for next week. Um, let me see if there's any more questions. A lot of those churches and preachers don't have full knowledge of truth. I, I agree. Um, that's why creation is in many of this. I'll take one more question. One more question. Anyone else? Sarah, go ahead. You can unmute your mic. Hi, I'm Sarah. <laughs> um, I don't have any question. I just wanted to um, say a little something about, just a little comment about Miss what Miss Jason just mentioned. She said, like the Bible is her proof. Um, it is true for us, but for others, not everybody believes. You know, because some people don't even believe that God actually literally wrote the Bible, like the Bible was inspired by him. So I think most of the time we need more proof, like it's a matter of really God revealing himself to these people so they could believe this is actually the living, you know, word. This is what I give you to, you know, for support. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Like, not everyone will believe that this is the proof, you know? We do, because we have Christ. He lives in us. We, we know him. But for most people, this will actually be the first thing they don't believe in, because they don't have any proof who wrote the Bible. You know, it all comes down to, I believe, I think it's Christ revealing himself to us. It's, it's, usually, um, it's usually the same argument. That yeah. we do all the time, and I get this a lot uh, when I'm working at my job, and they they set me up with drivers. Um, I mean, they set me up with people to train. I'll talk to them about the Bible, and they it's it's so crazy because if you just sit there and you think about it, Satan says he has the same same exact lie for everyone. God didn't write the Bible; man wrote it. It's the same. You should, it's just crazy how everybody has the same exact excuse, but they don't even realize it, you know? So um, he, he's the father of lies. He's just good at doing his job. And it's only through God, for me personally, uh, if you, for uh, many people to come to Christ, they have to experience something. I've noticed that. I experienced something. I was, um, I was homeless. I was sleeping in my I was sleeping in my car. You was homeless too. I see you, Jen. I was homeless, and I remember. Wow, praise God, man! I remember sleeping in my car, 
and um, it was a dead end street. It was the winter time. I had to leave my car on to put the heat on, you know, because it was it was the winter time. And I remember I didn't know anything about the Bible. I was dead end street. I turned around and I see this giant statue of Jesus, a banded church in the in the corner. Of course, I didn't know anything about idolatry. So I'm just, I see a statue. I'm just like, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of sleeping in the car. And I'm like, yo, Jesus, even though you a statue, <laughs> I said, you, you gotta, you gotta help me get out of this situation. I was like, I don't know how you're gonna do it. I said, I promise that I'm gonna change. Lo and behold, like I didn't know what I was saying at that time. But I remember I got a call from a, a, a relative. Why don't you live with this person? And I was like, wait, what? I end up living with that person. Um, I went from, from their house to having my own place. And it wasn't until I was alone in a basement apartment is when I heard God's voice. When I say, I, when, when you hear the story about Elijah, when he was, he didn't hear the voice in the earthquake. He didn't hear it in, 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 um, in the fire or whatever, but he heard it in a small, still voice. I heard, I don't care what anybody tell me. The reason why I'm here, I was in my basement apartment and I heard somebody say, if you die right now, what do you think is going to happen to you? And I remember I just started crying. I'm like, I'm a grown man. Why is the whole ground turning into a flood from the tears from my eyes? I said, what's going on? And all I could think of was the Bible has all the answers. I say, I don't know where else to go but the Bible. One thing led to another. And I mean, my, my story goes on forever. I'm not going to share my whole testimony. But when God calls you, you'll know. And it's a personal experience that he will put you through that you can't question his existence. You can't. Once you get there, that's it. If you go back, I don't know what's wrong with you. You know, but believe it or not, there are people, there are people who who they know this, they hear the voice, because you know the scripture says many are called, but few are chosen. So God calls everybody, but people choose not to not to go, they choose not to go to him. And, and but it's not true that also he can harden the hearts of certain people too, of some people as well. I you know, I kind of feel that people that are so that I that I've experienced that are super in denial they're like no a man wrote that no no they're super in denial I kind of feel like they, it doesn't matter if God talks to them like face you know like like literally like in the small whisper they will still not acknowledge it it'll just be over their head like they've been hardened the you know the scriptures make that much the yeah exactly there are going to be a group of people yeah. who are going to grieve away the Holy Spirit. It's not something that's instant. It's, 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 it's where God is consistently talking to you and you're just not listening to him. It's not a process that happens right, right away. People grieve away the Holy Spirit because God never gives up on us. We give up on him. We give up on him. That's what we need to understand. When we get to the point where we realize that you know, God is constantly fighting for us. It, the Bible says, God does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. He doesn't take pleasure in the death. So what does that mean? That means even the people who don't know him, it's sad for him to, to have to, um, you know, place judgment upon them. Even, even when God destroys them, it's an act of love. That's what a lot of people don't see. It's an act of mercy. God destroying them because he knows if he allows them to come to heaven they're not going to be happy because they're not happy with it now you ever try to talk to somebody about god ah, i don't want to hear it no i don't care whatever you, you ever try you ever try that now now imagine god allowed them to come to heaven and they see all of us happy they're going to be miserable they're going to be miserable so it's god's mercy to actually to just you know, to, 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 to cast them in the lake of fire as if they never even existed. You it's know? their, it's their judgment too. I mean, here's the thing. I think that God will harden people's heart enough to where 
finally they've had they've had enough with life and whatever they believe in and whatever is going on that they have no choice sometimes than to come to him they then, then to start asking i don't know what to do i don't know you know like to the point of maybe even suicidal thoughts or tendencies to where they have to go and maybe that's when an angel will swoop in and go, hi, have you ever seen this Bible? You know, oh yeah, my friend was talking about it. Maybe that's when, you know, he, that's his opportunity because everything is for the glory of God. And I think that, you know, somebody is hardened even, you know, in such denial and, you know, I know it all, I can do anything I want. Nobody's going to tell me, you know, that kind of attitude, the pride and all that it takes it takes them a good punch in the face i've been you know, here them to finally go because i picked up the bible and i kid you not that that is god speaking to me because i too was homeless i i had a bad marriage you know uh i have two beautiful babies both autistic you know um i I, I had to be homeless with my kids, never caught COVID, thank you, mm -hmm. Jesus, never had any issues, never got robbed or anything like that, never had to stay in the car, but I did stay in homeless shelters where it there's a lot of, you know, lowly people there that drugs or sick or whatever it is, you know, you know, perversion, you know, things like that. And we were always protected, always. And now I have my own place and it is, it's all God, you know, and, and when I have questions and I don't have anybody to talk to because everybody wants to give their opinion about it, but it's just so, it's so bad. I mean, it's so negative. It's like, it's so, a, I always I don't say, even listen to them. I go straight to the Bible and yes, I just, amen. Do and if I, I, and I, read, they would, they would, they would know it's true. It's proof. That's, I think, you know, like your cousin Sarah said, you know, people don't, they don't know it because they don't believe it. But once they pick it up and they actually open themselves to read it, maybe they will change their mind, you know? So humility, yeah. humility and humbleness will bring anybody to the truth. If you can't sit here and have a conversation with somebody to, and to be open minded to truth, you, you'll close your mind to certain things. Like you see how you were available to watch AOC, but you're humble enough to not believe that, okay, this has to be it. You're open to looking. There are many people who believe certain things. And that's why we have denominations where they're stuck. Um, they're stuck believing in whatever the first thing that, that came, that, uh, that they were like brought to believe. And as a result, as a result of that, when you bring something new to them, they're always in conflict and they always want to argue. And it's always about, I want to be right and you're going to be wrong. And the truth is lost in between the conflict. At the end of the day, it's what does the Bible say? As I'm speaking to you guys and I'm showing you guys these things, do not take my word for anything. Go strictly to the scriptures and see what the Bible says. You watch, when you watch Tiller's videos on School for Prophets, he's speaking strictly scripture. So what can what else can you say? It's not someone's opinion because they're reading from, from the scriptures. Let's be um, humble. Let's be open-minded. Even when we approach people who don't know the truth, we have to, we have to meet them where they're at. We can't be like, oh, that person's dumb because they don't know the truth. We can't do that. These are souls. Christ would never react that way to these people. We have to approach them the same way we would, we would approach a child because technically we're all children in the eyes of God. We're all children in the eyes of God. So I pray that, um, that this message, you know, was, was fruitful and I'm thinking about maybe I'll I'll do a poll or something in regards to in regards to topics. If any of you guys have any ideas in regards to topics and you want to send send me something, yeah, have my phone number. Send me a text message of maybe what yeah 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 think you're interested in. And what I will do, I'll probably put 
all the topics together and do some raffle. I'll pull out one and that's what we're talking about. Okay. And um, I would just, I'll give y'all an update, let y'all know, but let's close in prayer. It's getting late. And um, well, kind of getting late. It's 9.49, but I'm getting old. So, <laughs> all right, we'll, we'll close in prayer. You know what? I have an idea. We'll rotate. I'll open in prayer every session and I'll ask anybody who's in here to, to basically close in prayer. So who wants to volunteer to close in prayer? We'll rotate this, this uh, to close the session every, uh, I guess, every Zoom session. Anyone here? Come on, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Uh, you have something to say? <laughs> Go ahead, Sarah. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead, Sarah. Okay, I, I was just going back to what you guys were talking about um, with the word. Me personally, I believe that, like, remember, we, we have free will. God gave us free will, and he never forced us. He never forced his power on us. He never forced his ways on us. He always wait until... We know we're ready. Like, he doesn't force us for anything. It's the same when it comes down to the word. The people that we reach now to, they have, they have a free will. Um, some of them, the reason why I believe they don't believe, that's because they choose not to. Like, willingly, they choose to deny the Lord or they, they, they didn't receive it. So that's why I was, when I was, when I heard you were saying how, like, Sorry, I'm kind of losing it. But basically what I wanted to say, like Joanna just mentioned in her comment saying, like, remember, parable. Um, God didn't just did this to him for no reason. He knew that he was already, his mind was already set. This is why the Bible says, um, do not, um, with the dead thing, I let the dead bury the dead. It's the same way that already knew that Pharaoh was already like that. He already have a mindset. So his heart was already there. He didn't just do it for no reason. It's the same way when we're reaching out to the people and telling them about the word. They have a free will to receive what we're telling them or not. We, they're not just going to receive it like that. This is what the Bible specifically said when Jesus come at us when we were talking earlier. We have to go out and make disciples, preach. Um, and baptize them and then they study. So all of this comes with first believe. Do you believe in what I'm saying? Do, do, are you receiving what I'm telling you? And then from there you will know. And then with study and then from there you will have a better understanding and let the spirit lead you. I think that's why when we, um, talk, when we literally tell people about Christ, it's better if we let the spirit if we're led by the spirit if we let god you know guide us just so we know how to approach the people and what to say and what not to say because god knows their heart he knows how we can literally reach out to them so i think it's all about free will in us receiving him now, you need to be a preacher ma'am you really do because <laughs> you're so right you you were exactly right even jesus told his own you know disciples if they don't receive you you know dust your sandals off and keep going you know push, keep thank you. I, 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 I just remind me too when he also got said if you deny me i will deny you this is why he doesn't force anything on us because if you deny him here he will deny you because he gave you the opportunity the free will exactly to we to see and 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 you know what you're doing you have a conscious you know you you know this this makes me think about um, when uh, when Paul says one person plants the seed, another person waters it, but it's God who gives the increase. We we're, we're not in in charge of converting somebody. We so we either going to plant the seed or we're going to water a seed that somebody else already had planted. It's God who's the one who's going to make that um, that seed bear fruit within their hearts. So it's not our job and. It's been hard for me to understand that, but I've started to understand it now. You know, actually, when you try too hard, you actually hinder the work that God is doing within that person. 
by trying to convert them, we can't do nothing. It's all God's word. I just, I just want to give a shout out to Sarah. You guys don't know this. This is my cousin. She's actually responsible for me coming into the truth. God led me to read the scriptures. I came, I came, I remember the spirit told me to just go to her house and they had a fellowship and I was just on fire. You can ask her. It was, I would not stop texting them. I'm talking about a.m., all in the morning, at night, I'm at work texting them while I'm driving my FedEx truck and I'm not even, so, uh, you know, God will bring people, remember, as I just said, one person plants a seed, another person waters, God gives the increase. They planted the seed, somebody else came along, somebody else watered, and now look where I'm at right now, you know, so all praises go to God, but let's close in prayer. <laughs> let's close in prayer. Uh, uh, What's his name? Fellow Israelite, do you mind? Okay, you guys ready? Let's kneel if we're able to. All right. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity, for allowing us to come together before thee on your Sabbath day, Father. I ask that you forgive us for our sins. You cleanse us from all wickedness, guile, unrighteousness, Father. You wash us with the blood of Christ. You renew our heart, Father and you fill us with your Holy Spirit, and you guide us into all aspects of life. I ask that you bestow on us wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and clarity, that we may be a light unto others, and we ourselves may not be deceived. Father, thank you for all you've done and all you continue to do. Let the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. I pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Yes. Again, you guys got my numbers. If you have an idea in regards to topics to speak about next week, send it to my number. Uh, and again, I'll do some type of raffle thing where whatever comes out and I'll give you an update in regards to what the topic is going to be. Thank you, guys. This was really fruitful. And um, I hope you guys continue to come back. Um, Maybe the crowd might get a little bit uh, bigger. Maybe you have friends. Invite people. Let's, let's just fellowship, man. We need the fellowship. The scripture said to not forsake the assembly, you know? I mean, I, if we could all group up, that'd be cool, but I don't, I don't like wearing that mask. It's pandemic, but all right, guys. <laughs> um, good night. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Good night. Happy Sabbath. Good night. Thank you again so very much. Thank you.